Well, we are grateful, of course, uh, for everyone that's come along uh, this afternoon. Uh, anyone who knows me uh, knows that uh, a Sunday is a day where I take time out from that which I enjoy doing very much, and that's spending time in the garden. And uh, I've dodged the showers this week, and I've managed to get in and out of the garden and do some work in it. Now, this time of year, of course, is a time when you're actually finishing off a lot of things to do with vegetable growing. I am mostly a vegetable grower. I don't really do flowers. I look at flowers and I think, well, if you can't eat it, what's the point? So, you know, we've been gathering in, and so we've been enjoying at home tomatoes and potatoes, not so many of those, that was a bit of a failed harvest this year, some carrots and many other things. But one of the things I was doing this week, which I really enjoy, and I brought a visual aid, I was taking down my uh, runner bean poles and the plants, and then of course taking off the, the pods and shelling them, and taking out the beans. Now, I happen to really like the colours purple and pink and that sort of spectrum. And I'm convinced the, really, the reason I really enjoy those colours is because of these beans. I think they're absolutely beautiful. And of course, you're doing this at the end of the harvest with the promise of next year you've got something to plant and more to be gleaned. So I've been enjoying the garden this week and I've got a load of runner bean seeds there if anybody wants some for their gardens for next spring. Of course, the other thing about this week, not only is the harvest coming to an end, but summer has come to an end. Yesterday, you may know, was the uh, autumn equinox. Now, I, this has always confused me because in my head, the autumn begins on September the 1st. Well, actually it does as far as the meteorological year. So the autumn begins on September the 1st. September, October, November is the autumn. But the astronomical year, the autumn began yesterday, September the 23rd. And the reason it began yesterday is because that was the day when the balance between night and day was equal. And so we're now in the autumn. So the harvest has finished, more or less. I've got a few leeks and a few parsnips left to pull. And the summer's come to an end. And we've moved into a new phase in the year. And actually, those things reminded me of something that the Bible has to say about these times. And I'm going to share with you a verse from the Bible. Listen to these words. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Now, those words actually come from an Old Testament prophecy written by a prophet called Jeremiah. The words were written down 600 years before Jesus was born. And they were written during a time of real turmoil in the land where Jeremiah lived and, of course, where Jesus eventually was to be born. It was a time when the kings of the land had rejected God repeatedly. The prophets had been sent by God to remind not just the kings but also the population, to return to God, to abandon their idols and turn back to God. But time and time again, they had, they had rejected this call to repent and return to God. And because of that repeated rejection, and in line with the warnings that God had given through his prophets, through the writings, there was now a new era that was going to begin because God was going to begin a time of judgment. They had rejected God and God was going to now say, it is time for my warnings to come to fruition. If you know anything about the stories of this time, you will know that in the years that were to follow, very shortly after this prophecy, the Babylonian Empire would come. 
They would come with King Nebuchadnezzar. They would surround the city of Jerusalem and besiege it. The walls would be knocked down, the temple destroyed, and so many of the people, including the king, carried away in captivity. And thereafter, you get the stories of Daniel and the likes of the lion's den and so on. And so this was a really troublesome time for the nation of Judah. Listen to the words again. The harvest is past. The summer is ended and we are not saved. I just want you to think about how those words apply to our situation. The harvest is past. Well, we've spoken of that already. The summer has ended. We're now in a time of autumn. But what of these words that follow? And we are not saved. Really, when those words were uttered by the people of Jerusalem and the land of Judah in those days of Jeremiah, they had come to a realization, too late really, that actually all opportunity for change had passed. You see, they had repeatedly been warned of by the prophets that they needed to change their ways. They needed to turn to God. And they had said, no, not now. Do we have to? We have other things. We enjoy these. No. Maybe later, or perhaps some other time. And now they had realized that opportunity had passed. And we are not saved. And that cry is a cry of desperation, a cry of anguish, a, a cry of regret. Because it was too late. Just look in the news and we see what's happening in Ukraine. We, through the springtime this year, followed the news and how that there was a build-up of resources as weaponry was sent into Ukraine to support the war effort there against Russia so that they might release themselves from their, uh, in their occupied lands. And then in the summer, we saw the news how the offensive, the counter-attack had begun. But we're seeing news now how that there's been limited progress, how that they've not really gone as far as they'd hoped, they're not reaching their targets, and they're not really gaining land back as they'd hoped. And the fear now is that the time for war is passing because the seasons are changing and it'll be impossible to fight any sort of battle in the winter months. And so likewise, the harvest is past, the summer is ended and we are not saved. You can just imagine the Ukrainians crying out later in this season similar words. But of course, these words can be applied to us also in a spiritual respect. Because the people of Judah, and I suppose the people of U Ukraine, they need rescuing. Rescuing from peril. Rescuing from the oppressor. Rescuing, possibly, from death. The summer is past. The harvest is over. And we are not saved. Well, there is a question that we need to ask. A simple question, but one that requires a great deal of thought. Here's the question. Am I saved? I'll ask it directly. Are you saved? Now, what on earth does that question mean? Are you saved? And you might just be thinking, well, do I need saving? What do I need saving from? If I do need saving, well, who will save me? And if there is someone who will save me, what have I got to do to be saved? Now, this is good gospel vocabulary, good news vocabulary. Because there is a message that needs to be spoken 
and heard and responded to in relation to this question, are you saved? First of all, do I need saving? Well, listen to these words from the Bible. We're going to quote a lot of verses in the next few moments from the Bible because the authority for what I have to say is not me. It's not my friend. It's not somebody I know. It's the Bible. God's Word. Listen to these words. Now is the, ex now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Are you saved? Because the Bible declares now is the time to be saved. Not tomorrow, not next week, not when I'm older, not when I've retired, not when I've become a grandparent. Now. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And why is there an immediacy to this. Well, it is because of this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We ask the question, do I need to be saved? The Bible speaks of everyone as being a sinner. Now, this is not popular vocabulary, perhaps. But it tells us that all people, for all, have sinned. We fall short of the glory of God. When we think of God, we think of him as being perfect, holy, true, just. And we do not in any way come up to his standard of perfection. And we fall short of it. And because we fall short of it, and because God is holy and he is just, we stand before condemned and so we do need saving. Saved from what, we might ask? Do I need to be saved? Well, saved from what? We're all sitting here this afternoon, and we're comfortable. We may have a few ailments, a few aches and pains. We might have some worries. But what do we really need saving from? Listen to these words from the Bible. The wages of sin is death. And again, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. And also, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after that, the judgment. Do we need to be saved? Yes, we do. From what? from the consequences of our sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but the wages of sin, the consequences, the outcomes of sin is death. When we talk about sin, perhaps we should explain it. You may be good people. I'm sure you all are. You may be well respected in your communities. You may do that which you consider to be right. But nonetheless, we fall short of God's standard, and we are all sinners. And because of that, we need saving. Because the consequences of our sin is that God will judge, and the judgment as a consequence of sin is death. Eternal separation from him. I just want you to think upon that for a moment. We live but a few years upon earth. But after death, we live on. We don't get annihilated. There is heaven or there is hell. The Bible speaks clearly of these things. The Lord Jesus more so of hell than of heaven. Do we need to be saved? Yes, because of our sin. The consequences of our sin, God's judgment. Well, who then will save me? And now we move into more positive aspects of our thoughts. 
the Lord Jesus said this word, these words, when he had come to the house of Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector, who had defrauded the people in his own community, stole from them, made himself rich by his own greed, but had recognized his guilt and had repented of it, and the Lord Jesus saved him. And the Lord Jesus said to him in his house, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. The ones who are lost are us, the sinners, those who need saving. The Lord Jesus, the Son of Man, came to seek and to save that which was lost. The whole purpose of the coming of Jesus into the world was to save those that needed saving, as we've demonstrated from God's word, us. Tax collector Zacchaeus, yes, but all of the people in the city of Jericho there that he visited, all of the people in that land in that time, and all people of all time and of all color and of all race and of all language, he came to save. The Lord Jesus, he came to save. But listen to these words. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Who can save us? The Lord Jesus, but only the Lord Jesus. This is really important because as we look across at our world and our cultures and the diversity of faith and philosophy and religion within it, we must understand the words of the Lord Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He was being exclusive, saying that the only way to be saved was him, by him and through him, and that there is no other way. How then might the Lord Jesus save us? How does he save? The Lord Jesus came and he did miracles. He spoke wondrously. People marveled at his words. They were amazed by the authority of his teaching. They wondered at the miracles he did making, healing those that were sick and raising people from the dead. But that wasn't the ultimate purpose of his coming. He came that he might be a sacrifice for sin so that he might save. Listen to these words from the Bible. Who his own self bear our sin in his own body upon the tree. When the Lord Jesus died on the cross at Calvary, he didn't do it for sins of his own, for there were none. Listen to these words concerning that. God made him, the Lord Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God. And the Lord Jesus, who was perfect, in every way, took upon himself the guilt of all those that needed to be saved. And God judged him for the guilt that wasn't his own, but he chose to bear, but rather was ours. And the Lord Jesus died for us. He died in our place. We spoke earlier of the wages of sin is death. That's a grim thought. But the Lord Jesus chose death that had no right upon him, had no authority upon him, so that we should not die eternally. How does he save? Because he bore the wrath of God on our behalf. He died, he was buried, and praise God, he rose again on the third day, demonstrating his power, demonstrating the victory that he had won over sin and death and hell and Satan, demonstrating his ability to save. 
But we come to one more question. Then what must I do to be saved? If we need to be saved, if we've seen what we need to be saved from, if we've seen who can save us and how he is able to save, well, what must we do to be saved? Well, actually, that question was asked by a man who was a jailer in Philippi. Paul and Silas, who were amongst the first missionaries, had arrived in Europe with this message of salvation, and they ended up in prison because of it. And they sang praises to God, and they prayed, and there was an earthquake which released them from their shackles. The doors of the prisons were opened, but they didn't escape. The jailer, who thought they had and would have, he was about to kill himself, for he knew that that would have been the consequence of losing all of the prisoners anyway, was stopped from doing so by Paul and Silas. He said, we're all here. And the jailer asked the question, what must I do to be saved? And this is the answer for him and for us. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The question we began with is, are you saved? And we could re-ask that question, do you believe? on the Lord Jesus Christ? What are you trusting? What are you depending upon for the security of your soul in eternity? The Lord Jesus Christ. Only Him. Only He is able. Only He is willing. Do you believe? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's the promise of God spoken by the Lord Jesus. He came that if we believe, we will not perish, but have everlasting life. One of the verses we quoted earlier, the wages of sin is death, actually has an ending which says, but the gift of God is eternal life. There it is. Believe and be saved. Be saved and be given a gift, eternal life. The Lord Jesus, when he spoke those words, for God so loved the world, spoke them to a man called Nicodemus who was searching for the answer. And the Lord Jesus said to him, you must be born again. Now, I told you earlier that my daughter has possibly gone into labour and soon... Uh, her daughter will be born. And Nicodemus said to the Lord Jesus, he said, how is that possible? How can I be born again? Am I to enter again into my mother's womb and be born? The Lord Jesus wasn't talking about a physical rebirth, but a spiritual one. One that will only come about when we trust in him. Do you know one of the wonderful things about seeds? When we come back to where we started, these seeds. We plant them and they grow and they bring forth fruit. The Lord Jesus, when he died, he went into the ground, into a tomb, but he was born again, resurrected to new life. Life that was his by right. And as a consequence of that, there will be many others who bring forth fruit. Do you need to be saved? Yes, you do. The summer is past. The harvest is over. And we are not saved. Well, you don't need to say that last bit if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, your Saviour. Now, Michael is just going to uh, give thanks for the food and then we'll be able to share some time with one another.